you know, it's not like when you commit to somebody or get married, your brain just fundamentally changes and a switch turns off and the rest of the world doesn't exist. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 318. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people, just like you. And today I have a Q&A episode, um, doing something a little bit different this time, uh, in that I'm just doing one question instead of two. It's uh, been hot as fucking balls, as most of you are probably aware, if you live in you know uh, this region. Man, it's been crazy, you know, well over 100 a lot of days. And even right now at 9 o'clock p.m., it's 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, one of the things about recording the show in my setting is that um, we don't have central air. We just have, you know, like little window units. And I can't really record the podcast while the fan or the air is going. So I had the air running before coming in here, just spritzed off in the shower and good thing about doing an audio only podcast is you don't have to wear too many clothes. Stop it. No. Bad. <laughs> but yeah. Um I'm I'm going easy on myself this time. Um but yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about life and and ramble a little bit at the start here and then I have one really good question from a listener like yourself. If you'd like to send me in a question for the show, uh please do so. I've been getting really good questions lately, so please keep them coming in. Even if you've already sent in a question, please feel free to send in another question or an update to your question. It's all good. The more I have, the better. It gives me options for each episode. Um, but you can send me a question to duffthesyke at gmail.com or go to my website, duffthesyke.com and use the contact form there. And then, of course, if there's ever a question about whether your topic has been covered before or you're just curious about a specific topic, use the search bar on the website. It's really good, really powerful. You can find all sorts of content on there from you know, information about therapy, to information about um, relationships and communication, to ADHD, to anxiety, and all sorts of stuff. So definitely check out the website and use the search bar. Um, I'm going to rant a little bit here. This may not be applicable to many of you, but I like putting these little, <laughs> you know, uh, things that I encounter in my in my work life out there because there's a chance that um, it may apply to some of you, and there's a chance that you may find yourself in this position in the future. Um, so I'm talking about my work as a neuropsychologist. So today I had a, a case where someone was sent in, um, in their, you know, later seventies and they have a family history of Alzheimer's disease. So with that you have, you know, an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, but it's not a one-to-one -one thing. It's not a sure shot, but you do have, you know, more risk of it than somebody who does not have that family history. Um, you know, some of the signs are there history of memory loss over, you know, the past, past couple of years, kind of just short term memory stuff, and then getting progressively worse. And they go and see a neurologist and the neurologist puts them on the medication called a uh, Dinepazil. The brand name is, uh, Aricept. There are several medications in this class. They're what are called, uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, which is a huge term that basically means in a roundabout way, it helps your cells in your brain, your neurons fire more quickly. Like basically it just helps them fire more often. And unfortunately, a lot of doctors will tell you that those types of medications help to slow the progression of dementia conditions like Alzheimer's disease, you know, progressive conditions that get worse and worse. So they'll say, okay, this will help slow things down. It does not do that. Um, the medication is, it, those medications are very imperfect. Unfortunately, we're at a point in time where we have very limited medications available for things like Alzheimer's disease 
the ones we do are not very effective, unfortunately. You know, there's something, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but they they don't stop any disease process that's breaking down the brain. They don't slow that down. They just basically cover it up, right? In the same way that somebody who takes um, Adderall or Ritalin for ADHD, they don't actually you know, achieve better attentional control in the long term. It just helps them while they're taking the medication. It doesn't like fundamentally change the brain or reverse things. It's similar to that. The thing is, it's it's not very effective for a lot of people. It tends to be more effective in people who are in the very early stages who don't have really significant dementia or, you know, don't have very significant cognitive impairment in general. And there can be side effects. Um, one of the common ones is gastrointestinal issues, you know, so having diarrhea, having upset stomach, things like that. And for some people, there are, you know, more severe side effects. And so for this person, they came in and, you know, looking at the background paperwork, I'm like, okay, I see memory loss. I see um, vivid dreams. I see visual hallucinations. So seeing things that aren't there, like um, starting off as like mistaking a hat hung up as a person, but then seeing people elsewhere in the house things like that, and then more vivid kind of psychedelic experiences that were not happy, that were scary and alarming. Um, and so with that, I start to wonder about, you know, what types of brain disorders might be causing both of those things. But when I get the history and actually, um, you know, kind of dig into it, this person did not have hallucinations before they started this Aricep, the Denepazil. And they started it, and they got hallucinations. The doctor upped the Denepazil, they got worse hallucinations. But instead of taking them off of it or trying a different medication within the class because there are multiple, they added Seroquel. So uh, quetiapine, I don't know how you say it exactly, but um, it's an atypical antipsychotic medication that is helpful for people who have hallucinations. Um, it's also helpful for things like bipolar or various disorders where you have kind of uh, extreme emotional reactions. But it's a heavy medication, man, and especially in older people, it's, it's one that, that's um, pretty intense, and it is very sedating, and it often causes people to have kind of a hangover effect the next day where they're not feeling very alert and aware and stuff like that. And so we're just getting into like poly polypharmacy territory, meaning, you know, multiple medications and some of the medications being used to solve the side effects of other medication. But I was kind of dumbfounded. I'm like, are you fucking serious? You know, I was very frank with these people. I'm not a medical doctor, right? Um, so I can't exactly like tell them what to do, but definitely gave my impression that there's something to miss here because, you know, the whole Occam's razor principle, like which solution would require the least assumptions is that the medication is what caused the hallucinations. So stop fucking taking it. <laughs> not only that, there were also GI side effects or gastrointestinal side effects. And it doesn't seem to be helping at all cognitively. And if you think about it, there's a very good chance that it's actually hurting cognitively because if this person is having vivid dreams where they're waking up afraid and they're having you know poor rest because of the medications that they're on, then they're likely not getting that deep sleep that's needed for memory consolidation, meaning their memory is actually going to get worse and they're going to be less aware um, than they would be otherwise. So, you know, all this is to say, I, I suggested to these people that they get a second opinion. And, you know, one of the issues that they had with this doctor who was a neurologist, a, you know, brain specialist, is that they didn't spend a whole lot of time with them, right? So the neurologist spent just, they said like a few minutes with them, with a student there and took some notes and then kind of sent them on their way. So if you're ever in a position where yourself or you have maybe a family member that you're participating in their care, you're being their caregiver, what have you, and you feel like you're just not getting the time of day, you feel like you don't understand the reasons behind the treatment that they're receiving, you feel like there are issues going on that are, you know, not helpful, definitely advocate for them or for yourself. Get a second opinion, you know, ask another specialist, ask your primary care if that sounds right, because, you know, we put a lot of trust in these providers, and especially as you sort of go further and further out from primary care and get more into these specialties and subspecialties, you know, you're going to put your faith in them because you don't know what the heck they're talking about. But unfortunately, even specialists are not immune to just poor decision making. So yeah, that was my day today. Hopefully this, this is going to help lead them in the right direction. But I was, I was pissed on their behalf and just kind of, as I said, dumbfounded by that. Um, it, what I suspect is that this person does have a degenerative condition like Alzheimer's. So their memory and other, you know, cognitive skills will continue to get worse year by year. 
but this is being exacerbated by the medication because they're having a reaction to it and it's giving them these hallucinations. So taking that piece of it away is not going to stop you know, them from getting worse, but it's going to give them an upgrade to their quality of life right now, which matters a whole lot. So yeah, that's my rant. That's my hope. Hopefully you guys aren't there snoring. Um, that's, this, is, this is part of my job. This is part of what I do. And so I want to make sure that I share that information because there aren't a lot of places out there that do kind of talk about this sort of thing, at least for people like you and not clinicians like me. So yeah, that's that. Only other thing is that if you haven't checked me out on Instagram lately, I've definitely been upping my game. I'm doing a lot more um, posts that are related to, you know, thought-provoking questions, mental health content, reels, not just stupid, silly reels, though some of them are pretty silly, but stuff that, you know, is, again, thought-provoking, related to mental health or psychology, anxiety, depression, stuff like that. So check me out at DuffThePsych on Instagram. Say hello. And that's quite enough rambling. Let's go ahead and get into the first question. Okay. So first question is, uh, why did I say that? Oh, God, I'm so on autopilot. Usually I have more than one question. The one and only question, I should say. Um, it's a short and sweet one, uh, but it reads, is it normal to have interest in others when you're married? What do you do when you're interested in another person? So that's it. And uh, thank you. Hello to the question asker. I think this is a really great question. And I'm glad that you're asking this You know, earnestly. You're asking an honest question here that I think a lot of people are really afraid to ask or afraid to approach in any sort of way. There's a lot of guilt associated with it and stuff like that. Um, so I just want to first normalize things and give you just an overall answer, which is yes. <laughs> yes, it is totally normal to have interest in others when you're married. I 100% think that, you know, depending on the society that you're living in, um, what sort of structures you were raised in, there's a good chance that you were brought up with a lot of influences through media, school, family, maybe religion, that place of massive value on things like monogamy, meaning being with one person for your life, uh, fidelity, meaning staying you know, faithful. I say the big air quotes because that can mean a lot of different things, um, but there are a lot of moral judgments about what is and isn't okay. And all of this sort of sets you up to have a bit of an unreasonable expectation about you know, how your body, how your mind is supposed to react to other humans out the world, out there in the world, as if it's some sort of crime to like be human. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly what the right thing to do here is, but, um, you know, in my opinion, one of the primary things that makes us human, that separates humans from other animals is our ability to have an impulse or an instinct, you know, to have something that, that is just unavoidable that, that happens within us. And then to take that as an input and make our own decision decisions about what to do with it, right? So we don't have to act on that impulse. You take a lower organism like, say, an alligator, right? An alligator, a crocodile, they're very um, amygdala-driven, right? So the amygdala is the part of the brain that is uh, basically where our fight-or-flight response comes from. So if you kind of look at an alligator or crocodile, they're pretty chill most of the time, right? They kind of just sit around. They chill in the water or next to the water. And they wait. And then when they have some sort of input, some sort of uh, impulse that, that gets them activated, their amygdala kicks into overdrive and they just, boom, they like attack, right? And that's how they catch their prey. So they're very, very much driven by that. It's not like they see something and they're like, hmm, I wonder if it might be a good opportunity for me to feed right now, or if I should wait, see if they have more friends coming. Let me see if there's a bigger one coming around. You know, they don't like have this complex hypothetical situation they're playing out in their mind. They're unactivated and then they're activated and they act on that instinct. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, BetterHelp. I have a confession to make, which is sometimes I can be uh, a little too solution oriented, <laughs> whether it's my own problems or somebody else's who is not paying me to help them with their problems. I can be really stuck in my own head about figuring out, you know, solutions for things. I'm there washing the dishes and just like, you know, running through different possibilities. And, you know, while in that problem solving mode, sometimes I get a little bit lost in that and don't see the big picture. 
And so it can be really, really helpful to have somebody from the outside to help you become a better problem solver and provide a more balanced perspective. And I think that's one of the areas where therapy can be really helpful. It doesn't always have to be necessarily about deep psychiatric issues, though that can be a part of it. Sometimes it's just about having that person to bounce ideas off of to help balance you out and to help point you in directions that you might not be seeing. If you're interested in looking into some therapy, you might want to check out BetterHelp. BetterHelp is convenient, accessible, and affordable therapy that's done completely online. You can get matched with the therapist very quickly after filling out a brief survey. And at any time, if you feel like you're not with a good match for you, you can switch therapists. You can do text, you can do video, you can do lots of different formats. So it's good for anybody, regardless of your comfort level with therapy. And often it's way more affordable than in-person therapy. So if you want to check it out, if you want some help, you know, looking at the problems in your life, visit betterhelp.com slash duff, get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash duff for 10% off your first month. All right, back to the show. We aren't like that. We have these huge frontal lobes, uh, meaning the, you know, the front part of your brain behind your forehead. And that allows us to do many things. You can see it evolve over time. If you look at the brains of different animals, um, certainly primates, you know, other, other monkeys, they, they have bigger frontal lobes. A lot of mammals have, you know, somewhat decently sized frontal lobes, but you can see down the evolutionary chain, it get bigger and bigger with humans having a very large one with lots of folds and wrinkles that provides a lot of surface area, meaning, you know, a lot of room for, for neurons and in processing. And so that frontal lobe allows us to take various inputs. You know, we have our thoughts, we have our feelings, we have physical sensations, we have the context of the situation, and we're able to imagine things. We're able to run the simulation through, right? Before you go and confront somebody about something, whether it's physical or verbal, you have a sort of simulation that plays in your head. You think, okay, what, what am I going to say? How are they going to respond to that? What, I'm, what am I going to do when they respond in that way? And you go through all those steps, and then you decide on a specific course of action and act. There are obviously things that we don't have that much um, control over. Like, you know, if we are to get startled, we're going to possibly, you know, jerk or move our body in some way. And that's more of a spinal reflex. It doesn't even go to our frontal lobe. It's just like boom, boom, and then reflex. But for things like this, um, we do have a lot more control than other animals. And so I think that's one of the things that makes us human is that we can have that sort of instinct like, oh man, that person is attractive. And we're not just going to like rip off our clothes and go run after them, right? We're going to be like, hmm, okay, what should I do with that information? And that's the frontal lobe in action. So again, I'm not trying to say that there is one correct course of action. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about that. But what I'm trying to say is that, um, it's not so much that the feelings you have matter, the feelings that come up, it's what you do or don't do with them, what decision you make there. We simply don't have a whole lot of control over who we're attracted to, right? Like just ask somebody who has been tortured or persecuted for being gay or queer in some way. Like um, if they could just snap their fingers and not be that way, in some cases people might do that. You know, that's why conversion therapy doesn't work. You can't just like remove that. You don't have control over these things. It's part of who you are. So yeah, you can't just snap your finger and decide to be attracted to a different gender. And for you, you know, it's not like when you commit to somebody or get married, your brain just fundamentally changes and a switch turns off and the rest of the world doesn't exist. Um, You're still going to find other people attractive. You're still going to have the instinct to imagine what it would be like to be with other people romantically or sexually or otherwise. You're still going to have curiosities. Um, Certain people are still going to resonate with you in a way that feels very compatible, right? So it's going to be like, wow, this is a natural connection. That can still happen. It's like, again, none of these things go away just because you got married. You're just making a choice about what to do with them. So yes, I think it's normal. I think it's definitely normal. I also think that a lot of problems actually arise from being in denial about this or pretending like you don't have these feelings, you know, just pretending like it's not a thing like, Oh no, there's no other person in the world, but you. Um, And there is sort of this toxic testing behavior that I see some people do in relationships where they, they check, they check in and they see like if they're the only person their partner wants. And a lot of this definitely, I think stems from insecurity and they'll say things like, babe, you know, what do you think about that person? Um, and then the person goes, Oh, I don't know, babe, you're the only one that I want. You're the most beautiful person in the world. I don't see other people anymore. They're just there. 
Like, <laughs> you know, like, come on, let's be real here. Like you've committed to this person. That's amazing. That's great. You know, if you're, if you're uh, monogamous or otherwise, and you'd still, you know, have this person that you're committed to, like, great, cool. I think it's even more of a compliment to know that, yeah, you do have feelings. You do have normal human impulses. And yet you're deciding that this person is worth it to you to just put all of your eggs in that basket and really be committed to them. But pretending like it's not a thing, that's just, you know, I, I don't think that leads to good outcomes. Like, yes, you should like your partner. You should be attracted to them if that's important to you. Uh, but that doesn't shut down the part of your brain that feels attraction at all. So that's just not how it works. Um, by pretending like it does, you can sometimes ignore things that really should be processed and brought to your conscious awareness. I think this is sort of where people sometimes fall into the whole work wife or work husband thing. I'm not sure if you've heard that term before, but you know, it's where you have somebody at your workplace that you see all the time every day or, you know, every work day. And you fall into this pattern where you have kind of a, an attraction, maybe a natural connection to somebody at work. So you gravitate toward them. And, you know, among all the people there, you spend the most time with them. You get along really well. Maybe you joke a lot. There's a little bit more, you know, touchiness or things like that, where it's just very comfortable and it feels good. And you maybe enjoy the attention. And if you ignore that and you're in a situation where that's not acceptable, then things start to build and you maybe start to get into trouble because you find that your spouse is jealous or you're acting in a way that's inappropriate within your relationship or considered inappropriate within the workplace, whatever, you know, and so it's sort of like this is building under the surface and unacknowledged. And so then there's an opportunity for it to sort of explode and that can sometimes lead to bad consequences. Now, when it comes to what to do about it, right? So yes, it's normal to feel feelings for other people when you're married. Not a whole lot you can do about it. It's going to happen, right? Um, well, there's a whole lot you can do about it, but you can't do anything about the feelings themselves. So what to do about it? The answer is going to depend. It can go in a million different directions. Uh, now, if you are listening to this and you've been sort of smirking the whole time, it's because you already know my situation. My wife and I are one example, but one I don't expect most people to be interested in replicating. Um, so we're in what's called an ethically non-monogamous relationship. This hasn't been the way we have been all throughout a relationship, but it has been this way for years now where we are allowed to have romantic or sexual relationships with other people. This could be something that's committed. It doesn't have to be. It could be just for fun. It could just be for friendship. And sometimes that friendship evolves into something that is sexual or romantic, whatever. Um, you know, ironically enough, my wife is out on a date right now. She's seeing somebody for the second time and I'm here at home with the kids and, you know, doing my thing and that's great. Um, and then this weekend, you know, I'll be going and staying with my partner for a day. So, um, you know, it, 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 this is how we do that. There are many different forms of non-monogamy. Uh, our version of it is not the only one. And this is what works for us. And it's something that we've communicated heavily about and set our own expectations and boundaries where appropriate and things like that. So in our case, the answer to what to do with it, if we are interested in somebody um, that's outside of our marriage, is basically think about it. Consider if there's somebody that we might want to pursue. If that's a, you know, if that's like kosher on the other side with that person, we don't try to go, th go with people who are unavailable or something like that. And uh, yeah, it doesn't mean we're trying to get with every single person we see, but if the option is there and we'd like to explore it, we can do so. It, but that's our relationship agreement, right? That's our particular relationship agreement. And, and that's all good within that. I, I think a lot of people kind of uh, don't think that cheating is possible within non-monogamy, that it's sort of just a free-for-all. And, you know, in some cases, people are very, very anarchistic about it, meaning anything is okay, anything goes. Um you know, that doesn't have to be the case. It can be. But basically anything that's outside of your relationship agreement and your boundaries, that could still be considered cheating. So cheating is certainly possible within non-monogamy. Um, but it's, you know, it looks a little bit different than it would in just a very straightforward monogamous relationship. But, you know, even before we agreed to be non-monogamous, we were pretty open about things like attractions and things like that. You know, it was understood that we weren't going to do anything about it. We weren't going to pursue a relationship with somebody else. But we understood that it's not a crime to be attracted to somebody else, that you can't help it, you know, that, you know, you might have a natural friendship or, you know, inclination to uh, get along with somebody and that's okay. But there were still expectations for what's considered appropriate behavior given that the feelings themselves are just feelings. It's just what it is. 
Now, um, that's, that's us. That's not everybody. That's not going to be most people. In some cases, the answer about what to do for having feelings for somebody outside of your marriage is also nothing, but in a different way. Like if it's a private thought and an attraction and you would never do something about it because that would be outside of what's okay in your relationship, then there might be nothing to be done. It's fine. Like you journal about it if you want to, you fantasize about it, acknowledge it to yourself and and let it be. If nothing's going to happen there, then nothing's going to happen there. You didn't do anything wrong. You don't need to confess, apologize, or feel bad for something that you didn't do. Even if you had a daydream about what life would be like with this other person, or even if you, you know, masturbated, had self-sex while fantasizing about this other person, you didn't actually do anything to violate your relationship agreement. Those are just private thoughts in your head that you have the right to have. It doesn't affect anybody else. Now, my response here obviously does not factor in religion or culture. Those are things that are not important to me. So if they are to you, you know, those things may have specific uh, opinions or guidelines even about your private thoughts. So, you know, just keep that in mind. You know, I don't believe that there's some being out there that's monitoring me from the clouds or whatever. So, um, you know, that's, that's my own kind of personal bias to it. So please take this with a grain of salt if your perspective on life is a little bit different. Um, but again, you know, if you're having these private thoughts, you're not doing anything about them. There's no risk of you doing anything about them. Then you, you truly haven't done anything wrong. Now, if you think that you're interested in another person in a way that's going to be disruptive to your marriage, that's a different story. You may need to address it. Um, I've certainly had people that I've worked with in therapy come in and let me know that they're worried about potentially making poor choices with somebody outside of their marriage. And they want help with that. They want help and support. Um, so talking with somebody like a therapist or even a friend, family member, uh, to have some accountability can be very helpful, you know, so you can, you know, not ignore it because that's not very helpful, but sort of normalize it and recognize that it's a it's a risk that you want to avoid and kind of work through it. But of course, there's also the possibility that um, there are issues in your own marriage that are causing you to struggle with feelings you have for somebody else, right? If you're unsatisfied, you know, if you're really unsatisfied in your relationship or you're being treated poorly, the grass might look a whole lot greener on the other side. And I think that's super valid, something that you need to pay attention to and honor, you know? So you have options. You can work on the relationship, right? You can work on the the marriage through your own efforts, through, you know, figuring out how to communicate better, through therapy, a relationship coach, someone within your culture or the clergy and your religion, whatever, anybody that might be able to help you guys work through it. Um, you know, if it's a situation where you think that both of you might be open to changing the boundaries of the relationship, again, that's something that you want to talk about and communicate. And if that's going to be something that's actually constructive for your relationship rather than destructive, then maybe that's something that you start inching toward and, and opening up the box of communicating about. Um, but if it's something that you actually don't want to remain in this relationship, if you're looking at this other person and be like, wow, this is really pointing out that I'm not happy, that I'm not in a relationship that I want to be in, then the question becomes, you know, should you work toward leaving that relationship? Now, if that were the case, I want to caution you, right? If, you know, this attraction to somebody else, this feeling for somebody else is causing you to recognize that your relationship, your marriage is not one that's sustainable or good for you. That's that's good, but you also need to be careful about wearing these like rose-colored glasses when it comes to the other person because there can be a bit of a contrast effect that happens, right? These need to be two different things. That attraction to this other person could but does not have to be an indicator that something's amiss in your relationship. That does not mean necessarily that you should leave your relationship for that person, right? You might be seeing that person through a very sort of naive lens where it's like, yes, the grass is greener on the other side you know, compared to what I have from my perspective, everything looks so great over there. But, you know, you may not know them quite as well. You may not have lived with them. You probably, you know, don't know the nitty gritty of their life, except for what they've shared with you. So, you know, again, the grass can be very much greener on the other side. So I would be careful about like leaving somebody for somebody else. I think that the decision to leave someone should be based in that relationship. Like, this is not something that works for me. This is not healthy for me or them or both of us. That is what it is. Also, there's this person that I'm interested in. So let's see about that. I hope that makes sense, right? So just be careful about those sort of rose-colored glasses. Um, 
but yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like that's what I have to say about this. There's a lot to think about here for you. I'm not sure what your exact situation is. I'm assuming you're asking this for a reason. It's a simple question, but it's a super interesting one. So hopefully this gives you or anybody in a similar situation food for thought. Um, and thank you. So with that, that's the end of the episode. This has been episode 318 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. I am literally dripping sweat. It's disgusting. You should be disgusted. I'm disgusted with myself. <laughs> um, why am I dripping sweat at 9 o'clock? This is BS, man. Anyway, uh, if you want the show notes, go to duffthepsych.com slash episode 318. If you want to send a question into the, into the show, shoot me an email to duffthepsych at gmail.com. Take good care of yourselves. Stay safe out there. I know that the world is like kind of crazy right now, weather-wise. And also a lot of people I know are just kind of having heavier or sadder or more irritated times in general. So try to be gentle with yourself. Be safe. And I will see you guys for the next episode. Bye.